Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Happiness Journey with Dr. Dan, where every journey is worth living. My name is Dr. Dan. I'm your host for today's episode. I am a cognitive behavior psychotherapist specializing in anger management issues, both court appointed and private, marriage counseling, dissociative disorders, narcissistic personality disorders, depression, anxiety, dream analysis, and also provide life and business coaching support. If you need any assistance, reach out to DMV Counseling and Therapy Services at 301 325 1550. Today, I'm very excited to have on our podcast, episode number 19, very special guest with an S, Dr. Lorenzo Cohen and Allison Jeffries. Just like every other of my past episodes, I will leave it up to them to properly introduce themselves as no one can do a better job. Now, whoever wants to go first, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Dan, for, for having us on your show and, and for trying to, to spread message of, of hope and resilience to the world. My name is Dr. Lorenzo Cohen, and I am the founding uh, director of the Integrative Medicine Program at the MD Anderson Cancer Center here in Houston, Texas. MD Anderson is a freestanding cancer center that is part of uh, the university system here, but our singular focus is to help people who are dealing uh, with the disease cancer. And there is a whole branch uh, that as an aspect of what I focus in, which is cancer prevention. So how can we improve outcomes for those with cancer and then ideally prevent cancer in the first place, so overseeing research, education, and of course, delivery of integrative medicine modalities. And together with my wife, Allison Jeffries, we wrote a book called Anti-Cancer Living, Transform Your Life and Health with the Mix of Six, which we can get into aspects of today. Absolutely. Hi everyone, I'm Allison Jeffrey. So excited to be here and share this conversation today. Uh, I'm a teacher by training. Uh, I also have a master's in educational psychology. And like Lorenzo said, uh, we have written a book together called Anti-Cancer Living. Uh, we've also in the process of raising three children and living here together in Houston. Uh, and we spend uh, a lot of time speaking in our community as well as nationally on the topic of anti-cancer living. Beautiful. Um, one of the main reasons why I got you on the show is because my mom had breast cancer twice, not just once, but twice. And she came out 10 times stronger. I mean, this woman is like a machine, a cyborg. So, <laughs> um, and one of the reasons I, I'd like to discuss with you guys a little bit more about cancer prevention and is it based on the food they eat, um, the, the type of, you know, if they exercise regularly, uh, omit from smoking, drinking, etc. So we will get into more about the nutrition side, the physiological side, etc. So how do you want to get started? I mean, you guys are the professionals in that field. So you tell me, Dr. Lorenzo, how is the first step to prevent cancer? Well, we, everything that you said, I would say yes to. Is it diet? Yes. Is it exercise? Yes. Is does stress play a role? Absolutely. Sleep, love and support, uh, exposure to environmental toxins, which includes, of course, uh, tobacco uh, related behavior. Uh, but what we try and set up in, in our book, Anti-Cancer Living, is what we call the mix of six, the, the synergy and interaction of all of these. So the challenge has been to date that when you look at these individual behaviors in isolation, there's some associations, but it's not definitive. And people question how strong is the research? Rarely is it looked at together. Um, and when that has been done in some occasions, diet and exercise and better sleep, uh, we really start to see the importance of these lifestyle changes. Now, I'll hand it off to Allison to, to talk about where to start and, and why we start there. And just to add also to what Lorenzo said, that these lifestyle factors have a tremendous impact, but ultimately we sometimes do not know how somebody develops cancer mm -hmm. and that it can just happen randomly. But we do know that a large majority of cancers are attributed to lifestyle. And so we have a part to play and it's very important, I think, always in every moment, just to start from this moment 
where you are right now, that you don't look back, uh, you, you sit with yourself and you say, get rid of that blame, that shame, that guilt that we may feel about we might have smoked or we might have, you know, be eating improperly. We might uh, carry extra weight. We haven't exercised in years. That, that looking back isn't helpful. Starting where you are in this very moment is the, is, the best, is the best, most positive way to step forward. And there's so much that we can take on in very small steps. But one of the things that we talk about is that don't step forward with something that you want to change in your life until you have a support system in place. Because we often say, oh, okay, tomorrow I'm going to start exercising. And then you wake up in the morning and you feel tired because you've slept poorly and you, you know, you hit the snooze and then you skip the gym and, and it becomes this cycle and then you feel badly about yourself. And instead, what we recommend is that you put in place the support that you're going to need to accomplish something, however small it is first. So if you want to start an exercise program, you email your friends and you say, is anybody interested in taking a walk with me tomorrow? And that's it can be as simple as that. And then you have somebody who you're accountable to. Correct. Yes. And a huge, huge aspect of success is accountability and so you know not only is it good to reach out to your friends and your family to to let them you know join you because it's going to help them as well uh but to make sure that they're on the same page with you not to sabotage you and not that our friends deliberately want to sabotage us but you know if they know you're really trying to cut back let's say on alcohol or start to eat healthy um, then they'll think about, you know, maybe choosing a healthier dining option to go out on Saturday night because they're there to support you. Um, there's something else that's, you know, very important about social support is the research is, is really clear now that individuals who have more support are healthier. And we can measure this all the way down into gene expression. So how the controllers of biological processes in our body are functioning is directly related to aspects of love and support and happiness. Um, and so fostering your support network to help you in a tangible way is important, as well as the fact that it is just going to be good for our body. Beautiful. Now, here's a million dollar question for you guys, okay? Um, can cancer be cured holistically without having to go through chemotherapy or radiation or anything of that sort, but changing lifestyle? Like, for example, if you're pre-diabetes, if you change your healthy habits, chances are it's not going to go to stage two diabetes or, or diabetes type two. So is there a way to be able to eliminate cancer within your body? Or do you still have that, you still need to have that treatment of chemotherapy? Yeah, well, let's go back to, to exactly what cancer is. So, so cancer, and it's easiest to talk about solid tumors, which is, is what people are most familiar with, breast cancer, yes. prostate cancer, ovarian cancer. Um, cancer is uncontrolled cell growth. So within every cell in our body, there are systems in place that cells should replicate. They should replicate in a controlled, consistent, organized manner. And when something goes wrong within that cell, it can start to grow in an uncontrolled manner. Um, and this is, is the term cancer, uncontrolled cell growth. And the processes that are within the cell to stop that cell from replicating once it is out of control uh, are not working. And there's lots of different processes uh, and, and we go into some depth because it's important to understand some of the, the biology and the systems are redundant. So most people are familiar with the immune system. The immune system is one system that is constantly scavenging the body for cells that are misbehaving and knocks them out. Then there's internal processes, apoptosis, spontaneous cell death. Cells are supposed to spontaneously die when they lose these control uh, mechanisms. So cancer is when, that process, when those processes don't happen and it starts from a single cell 
and then it becomes two, and then four, and six. This is happening in our bodies all the time. So we don't all have cancer. We all have mutating cells. We all have cells that are misbehaving in our body. Our body is supposed to check that. Uh, and unfortunately, the statistics in the United States is that four in 10 men and women will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. So this is almost half of our population is getting cancer. If you were to layer heart disease, diabetes, yes. there's lots of overlap in these diseases uh, and, we, and we can get into that. Um, the majority of our population dies prematurely of diseases that are preventable. Now, you asked about the question of, of curing. Um, so preventing, we can say pretty definitively that we can reduce the risk, and it's important to think of this as risk reduction, by engaging in you know, what we'll get into of, of the mix of six. Uh, what, what preventing means is that you're stopping that mutating cell from becoming cancer. Now, once a mass is formed um, early on, would these lifestyle factors help? We think so. There isn't scientific evidence of that because it's hard to measure a a pre-cancer like we can measure pre-diabetes. Uh, but theoretically, if we could measure pre-cancer, uh, then we could. Dean Ornish, for example, has done research with prostate cancer patients, and we're replicating this with breast cancer, that if you take men with intact prostate cancer, they haven't done any conventional treatment, and they do intensive lifestyle change, you can make their disease regress. Were these patients cured? Uh, not necessarily, but they're probably not going to die of their prostate cancer. And those who were in a control group, their cancer tended to uh, progress, and many of them had to go and have conventional treatment. Uh, so by and large, once a cancer is formed, and in some cases, uh, there's evidence to suggest, for example, in kidney cancer, that that original mutation happened 50 years before the clinical diagnosis. So, you know, that begs repeating, 50 years ago is when that first mutation happened that set up that, can that, that mutated cell to grow into a mass. By the time it's a detectable mass on a scan that we have today, uh, the conventional approach is for sure going to be the safest way combined with lifestyle factors. Uh, making sure that you've harnessed the mix of six to be able to have your body be as inhospitable to that continued growth as possible. That's, that's really interesting. Now, would you, would you say, Dr. Lorenzo, that in an alkaline body, cancer cannot strive. In an acidic body, it can. So if you, um, if you change your eating habit, you do not eat any sugar or anything that has to do with the uh, high glycemic food, whatever it is, is it possible that you could reduce the mass? Because if you, if you basically drown the cancer, it will die in itself. So is that when you change the, the type of body like into more alkaline, can you kill cancer? Well, so there's, there's two questions embedded in there. One is this, this story of alkaline uh, versus acidic. It is true that, that cancer tends to uh, grow better, thrive more in a uh, alkaline tumor microenvironment. It also tends to grow better and thrive under a hypoxic environment, meaning uh, low oxygen. Um, however, you know, with that said, what we eat uh, by and large doesn't change the acidity of our blood that much. So okay. we, we are very tightly regulated, uh, 7.2, 7.1, 7.4. Uh, if we deviate too much from that, it's not healthy, low or high. So if I were to drink a, a, you know, 12 pH water every day and only eat very alkaline foods, um, I probably wouldn't change my blood pH that much. So it'd be very hard to, to change the tumor microenvironment from that perspective. However, what's interesting is that the majority of foods that are alkaline in nature are healthy for us. When you layer in 
sugar, sugar is, is a different process within uh, cancer growth and it does need this excess fuel. Uh, and we know in particular that fructose does drive cancer growth. So maintaining a low glycemic load, eating foods that actually tend to be alkaline uh, in nature um, is by default healthy. And I don't think that either one of them are necessarily changing the alkaline or acidic nature in our blood or the tumor microenvironment, but they're uh, activating the cancer hallmarks, which are the biological processes within our body, the immune system, anti-inflammatory processes, um, appropriate energy metabolism and exchange, that all of the changes will be creating biological processes that get activated to control the disease. Um, and, you know, we, we, we were talking about diet there, but the same is true for exercise, the same is true for stress, the same is true for sleep, what we call the mix of six. Oh, I see. And um, do you want to add something to it, Alison? <laughs> Well, I was just going to say that, you know, when you've received a cancer diagnosis and you're getting treatment, what you really want to do is feel like you're also contributing, that you can contribute to the success of your body uh, dealing with the cancer that's within it. And that control is, is a very important part and very, uh, it feels great if there are things that you can be responsible for. If you have your visit, your doctor and you're getting your conventional treatment, you know that you're addressing that side. But to take on lifestyle at home gives uh, the patient a lot of control as well as the caregiver, because we know that cancer is not just a diagnosis of the, for the individual, but it is a family diagnosis. Absolutely. And if you can help your partner or your child or your mother by taking this on as a family, that there is a lot of peace and um, and, and positivity that is associated with that. Wow. Now, um, I know there's a lot of diets out there, Doc, that, that, that does say that it helps with, um, like, for example, keto, which is, has a very low uh, carbohydrate intake and the intermittent fasting, um, anything that doesn't push the pancreas to secrete the insulin and anything under uh, glycemic index 95 will not let the, the pancreas secrete the insulin that is needed to be able to level the blood sugar in the body. So do you think that this can starve the cancer to be able to grow in retrospect? Or do you feel that, that, like you just mentioned, that there's nothing that you could do to be able to make your body more alkaline, but do you think if science can actually study more about how the pancreas um, works and be able to take supplements to be able to help avoid this happening? So, I mean, I, I think there's now a clear understanding that um, actually these lifestyle factors we're focusing on diet, but that they have an impact on our biology. Um, and when it comes to diet and glycemic low glycemic index, uh, there the, the data is pretty overwhelming that uh, these spikes, as you're talking about, which is what you get from uh, primarily refined foods, and not just carbs, but carbs that are um, devoid of the fiber. Uh, so white rice has a higher glycemic load than brown rice and barley probably has an even lower glycemic load than uh, brown rice. And what happens when you have a, sh uh, a glucose spike in the body is you have to have a spike in insulin and insulin then is driving inflammatory pathways. Uh, what's, what's interesting is, is that uh, we know that inflammation is, is one of the cancer hallmarks and, and cancer thrives under uh, a high inflammatory environment, same with heart disease, diabetes, in fact, Alzheimer's. Uh, so again, there's uh, a lot of parallels across these diseases, which is essentially chronic uh, inflammation. Now, the challenge with these diets, one, they haven't been studied well. So we say uh, glucose bad, so turn off glucose, uh, and everything will be good, aka the keto diet. Um, the problem we believe with the keto diet, particularly chronically, is that it doesn't have enough uh, fiber. Um, 
Now, could you supplement with fiber? Maybe, but, but that's not the, the basics of, of the keto diet. Um, what we know from diets actually is, is the, the diet that has been shown repeatedly and even within clinical trials, at least with heart disease and, and less with cancer, is uh, what's colloquially called the Mediterranean diet. Yes. But that Mediterranean diet is not too dissimilar than what we could call indigenous diets around the world, even though they may look different. What the traditional diet in Japan, in South Africa, in South America, uh, diets that tend to be low in uh, glycemic load, high in fiber, many of them do have uh, a certain amount of animal protein, but a very small amount. They do have fats, but they're healthy fats, and it's not 80% fat like a, a keto diet. Uh, but what's consistent across them is fiber. And we know from the research in microbiome that fiber is just critically important to maintain a healthy microbiome. Um, and the concern in particular with the keto is that it is uh, it, it may not be the healthiest diet, again, chronically in the long run for uh, the microbiome. Um, intermittent fasting is, is very fascinating and, and ongoing research. Uh, some research has shown that, that restricted eating time, which is, I guess you could say, daily fasting, um, it is, is, is linked with, with multiple, uh, disease outcomes. So instead of, you know, eating the standard three meals a day across 16 hours, you flip it and you eat those same three meals a day. Don't restrict calories necessarily, but you eat between 11 and six. Um, so this is really all ongoing. Uh, but the best recommendation we have now for, in particular, cancer patients is, is to try and approximate that Mediterranean diet, which is uh, a plant-centered uh, diet. And we can get into more details uh, if we want in that area. And just for your listeners, you know, if they're thinking, okay, well, you know, what does that really look like on my plate each day? One of the tools that we used when we were starting out changing our diet was that half of the plate becomes vegetables and not just sort of a bag of salad on the side, but actually, you know, broccoli, uh, you could do cabbage or coleslaw so that you think about your meal first with what are the vegetables I'm going to serve tonight or today? And then what's the rest? A clean and lean protein, a, you know, a great um, carbohydrate like a farro or a quinoa you know, moving away from those white things. Yeah. But so if you start that way, it can be very helpful. And, you know, you cook ahead of time. You don't have to make three vegetables a day, you know, three meals a day. You, you make a bunch of it and then you eat, eat it for the next couple of days. In our house, we make a big batch of cold slaw, not dressed, just, you know, white and red cabbage, uh, carrots, uh, cilantro, uh, green onions, and we put it in the fridge and we take it out as we want it each day for breakfast, for lunch, and then we use an oil and vinegar dressing. And we put on top tofu, if you eat chicken, uh, we have beans regularly with it, white bean that you can have in a can, uh, and that you just put on top and you have a, a great uh, meal there for lunch. Oh, that's actually appetizing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I myself, and the, the reason why I wanted to uh, bring up intermittent fasting, as you know, is becoming a very big movement, um, or I would say a diet, if you would call that a diet, because in the word diet is the word die, you know, if you really look at it. And because no diet are sustainable, because yes. kind of like do it for six weeks and stop it and do something else. Always change it because you have to shock the body to be able to see consistent results. So, um, when it comes to, uh, let's say someone is diagnosed with cancer, what fascinates me the most is that the body knows, and I've read it somewhere, tell me if I'm wrong, if you do not eat for 72 hours, the immune system in the body completely revitalizes, which it changes, it's kind of like you have a complete new immune system if you deprive your body from eating for 72 hours. And when you're sick, your appetite diminishes, which means that the body knows that it is time to be able to kind of uh, boost the immune system by not 
adding food inside the body for a certain amount of period of time until it can start fighting the disease. Is that correct or did I misread? I, I hadn't heard that, but in, in theory, it makes sense because of where energy is being diverted. If the body's energy is diverted to digesting, engaging the pancreas, the liver, et cetera, digestive enzymes, uh, there's limited energy. So the energy is going there and not to uh, the other systems. Um, but, but I hadn't you know, seen that scientifically. And when I did read about intermittent fasting before I start going into it, I've been doing it for four years already. Okay, so I do the 21-3 uh, format, which is 21 hour fasting and three hours eating. And I only eat one meal, but as you said, I'm not really reducing the amount of calorie during that three hours, but during the 21 hours, the pancreas is not secreting any insulin, which means that I put myself into a keto stage every single day. And this is how I can utilize my fat stored into energy without really depriving my muscle from food. And because usually the body will go to muscle to be able to get the energy before it goes to fat. But if you start changing and playing around, you could actually trick the metabolism. Yeah, I hadn't, that, that, that's a more extreme uh, <laughs> fasting. There's, you know, the more people are probably more familiar with, uh, with the 5-2 uh, and, uh, and you know, once a month, they, they do a three-day fast and, and these different. But uh, so how are you able in three hours uh, to consume 2,000 plus calories? You, you don't look, you know, you look muscular and, and, <laughs> fit and Well, I used to be, I used to do bodybuilding for many, many years. So I focus primarily the three hours into, I don't eat for three hours nonstop. I'll eat for one hour, take a break for one and eat one more hour. So every day at 5 p.m. I will eat. And then I stop eating at eight. And then the next day I start again. So it's all uh -huh. that same process, but I feel so much more energy. It's incredible doc, how my whole body change and I don't deprive my muscles from um, protein, but I just utilize a certain period of the day where I intake the food and I don't take 2000 calories, I actually take 1500 or 1300 a day, but I still kept my muscle, my muscle mass, surprisingly enough. Your, your, your basal metabolic rate uh, must, must have decreased uh, because if you were to type in your height and weight and find out what your basal metabolic rate is, it's, it's probably 1800 or 2000. I can't tell how tall you all are oh. from, from Zoom, but but uh, yeah, uh, I think but, but my BMI is high because I consider, I'm considered obese in the medical industry because my BMI is 27 because I, my height and my weight is, you know, doesn't really sync with yeah. the healthy side of the, because muscle weighs more than fat. So right. it will have an impact on my NBMI. So it's, it's kind of funny how it works because for me, I'm considered as morbidly obese. Which I'm not. <laughs> yeah, no, most most uh, most football players, you know, athletes who have a lot of muscle mass are technically obese, and that's why actually BMI is is uh, for for a sub portion of our population not a, a meaningful measure. Absolutely, not. it's relevant for most people, but but yes, there will be these uh, unique situations of of very athletic people where BMI is not relevant. So how in the family, uh, this is a question for you, uh, Allison, how in the family dynamic, when someone is being diagnosed with cancer, um, you, you said that they need to love and support. Obviously, this is something that uh, everyone must give. But again, their, their mental aspect of their, they fear death, because obviously, depending on what stage cancer they're in, um, death is imminent. So how do family can contribute to them changing their perspective and allow them to start taking advantage of life, live more, and still not deprive themselves just because of this diagnosis? You know, that's a great question. And uh, so many families, not only the person who has cancer, but those around, you know, can feel very discouraged and uh, uh, depressed about the situation. But as I was saying earlier, taking control is a very important part of uh, moving forward.
forward in a positive way. And the, the real goal is that we live each day, no matter who we are or, or how our health is, uh, well, that each day is the gift and that you live it in the best possible way. And so I think that, you know, it's a collective experience like living in a family is, is a collective that you, the people around you and with you work to help that person who is struggling. Um, I think it's important not to take anything off the plate. I think that, you know, if you're a caregiver of somebody who's struggling, that you step right up. You know, it's really important not to say, call me if you need anything, which I've done in the past. And then I realized, you know, nobody ever calls, right? It's you text, what can I do today? I am free from 10 to 12 and I'm just going to come and sit outside your door if you don't need me. But so give me something to do, you know. In our book, we talk about one of the people who saw that uh, she was she had a cancer diagnosis, but then her husband was also struggling and a friend stepped up and said, I really I'm going to gift you with three uh, sessions with a therapist because I think it will really be helpful to talk to somebody completely out of your community mm -hmm. and who can listen to you and provide guidance, you know, you those can be very uncomfortable conversations, but broaching it the first time, if it's not met with success, that you keep it there and you say, well, you know, consider that, you know, really taking your lead from where the, where the person is. But I think that if you can together do things to help each other, that that's very um, therapeutic and very positive. Uh, one of the things about love and support is that giving and receiving are equally important. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're the person with cancer, you can give back in ways that really help those around you as well. And so that relationship is very important. It's not that you just have to receive the help, but you can also give back in ways, limited ways, small ways, or big ways, depending on your situation. Um, it's complex, but there's so many positive things. You know, somebody we know took our book, uh, a husband of a wife who had a cancer diagnosis, took the book, read it, and, you know, in a weekend and said, okay, I know that there are things that we can do that can improve, you know, your situation and our family situation, and I'm going to help you do this. Um, so it's stepping up in, in those ways and making it a, a family um, endeavor. Yeah, well, you guys are a good team. You talk about the phys physical aspect and you go with the mental aspect. Um, that's actually great energy that you guys have. Um, but would you agree to a certain extent that positive thinking, okay, with meditation can actually help with that whole process in terms of not just the mental side of it, but also the physical? Because let's say someone is diagnosed with cancer and with their positive mind, they go and they exercise, they go and they eat healthier, they do everything that they need to do to be able to kind of like uh, hinge the progress of the cancer is that with long-term can actually um, reduce the growth and through surgery, they can remove the, the cancer or do they still have to go through the chemotherapy that destroys all the immune system? So now they're more prone to catch other diseases, which could get them sick even worse. So how does, where does the balance go? Well, I mean, avoiding conventional treatment is, is a dangerous uh, path to go down. And, you know, I was diagnosed uh, over three years ago now with a, with a stage three melanoma, which we know is extremely immunogenic, meaning the immune system helps to control it. Um, I had to make the choice then, and it was localized in my lymphatic system, so it wasn't in any major organ. Do I ignore the conventional system and just double down on meditation, diet, exercise, see how that goes for a little bit. Um, I, I, I definitely uh, chose to do both at the same time uh, because you only get one shot at trying this. And you know, if it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, then 
cancer is out of control and, and unfortunately often beyond the point when conventional treatment could have worked. We're, we're getting better in cancer medicine at, at more precise treatment. So I was lucky, let's call it, to be diagnosed with melanoma because immunotherapy uh, has really transformed the landscape and it, it boosts aspects of the immune system and has to be done carefully because an overactive immune system then leads to uh, side effects. But back to your question about, about positive thinking, uh, removing stress to the degree that you can, um, we dedicate a whole chapter and with lots of um, prescription and, and exercises for people to manage their stress because we know that stress creates a body that's hospitable to cancer growth. There's just no question. And, and you will not find a conventional physician who doesn't now acknowledge the importance of stress. Let's talk about it in a more technical term, sympathetic nervous system activation, the fight or flight response. When it becomes chronic, it, it harms our body. And in particular, all of the cancer hallmarks that are there to protect us from uncontrolled cell growth. Um, it, it diminishes their function. So it's very important to get stress management on board. And in fact, we argue uh, in, in our book, you know, we have love and support, sleep, and then stress. Those first three are critically important and they are often ignored. In our conversation today, which is very typical, and I don't say this in any negative way, we spent more time talking about diet. Uh, that's what people talk about. That's what people think about. It's certainly easier to control, but stress is equally, if not more important. You can eat all the healthy food in the world. If you are chronically stressed, you're still continually flooding your body with stress hormones that are deactivating all the processes that we need to, to engage. Um, and so it goes beyond just positive thinking. Uh, again, you can be thinking positively, uh, but still chronically stressed. So I think it is this whole mindset and, and the way you approach your life. And this is an overused term, but it's a term that's often uh, being used today of, of being mindful, but being mindful at, at kind of a, a meta level um, mindful in the moment, but, but mindful in everything that you do. It's often very hard to uh, take on a mind-body practice because most of us, at least in the United States, might not have grown up with a mind-body practice. Uh, some of us have had prayer that's been part of our lives, uh, and that certainly qualifies. But as far as things like meditation and yoga and Tai Chi, these are more foreign uh, mm. endeavors. But mindfulness and, and taking on one of these practices, you know, is a wonderful, wonderful way. And we're coming up to the holidays. And so I was actually just texting with our family uh, who we're meeting. And I said, what about if we try and all do meditation 10 minutes a day for our whole time together to see, to help the adults, the grandparents and the kids have this tool in their toolbox. Uh, and to teach those in our group who don't do this regularly, what it looks like. And it's as easy as downloading off of the internet, a 10 minute meditation. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of apps like Headspace and Calm and others that are have excellent meditation, uh, meditations that you can do that are two minutes or 20 minutes or longer. So it's very easy and it's great to start with a group. Yes. What about the binary sounds? Do you think like those ones actually impact the brain a certain way? Is it something that is very uh, like helpful? So the binaural, binaural uh, entrainment type of, so I, the, the re, there isn't great research on it. I know there is research on it. Um, and, you know, we have over Allison's shoulder there, one of these, uh, you know, Tibetan bowls. So it's this, this resonance uh, that is hypothesized to help change uh, the brain getting into a more relaxed state. Um, 
I think that's one way. Uh, it, it's not necessarily the easiest way. Um, I know for some people that it can be agitating uh, different frequencies. Um, and so, you know, this kind of leads in, in, into the question that I'll ask and then answer, which is what is the right mind-body practice? And, and ultimately it's the one that you're gonna do every day. That's gonna be become a, a habit. Um, and, you know, if you can engage in it, you know, for a, a, a period of time uh, at different times in the day, uh, that's even better. And then again, to bring that mindfulness approach to, to everything uh, that you do. I wanted to just come back to your point about, um, can we avoid conventional treatment? I think there are currently two unique situations that depending on the listener's cancer situation where it's kind of viewed as okay to, uh, to you know, double, triple, sextuple, engage in the mix of six uh, deeply and see how things go. And that's in early stage prostate cancer when it's been uh, confirmed that it's not overly aggressive and what's called uh, active surveillance is the appropriate decision. And the same is true for DCIS, which is early stage breast cancer, ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, and they can do imaging and, and techniques to know that this is still at a very early stage. Um, in those situations, in some sense, it's you could, it's, it's not pre-cancer because we've diagnosed it, uh, but it is very early stage. And that's a window of opportunity where you can, you can see what direction are things gonna go and you know, engage in the mix of six as, as much as you can. Um, and then six months later, go back in and, and see which way things have gone. And, and hopefully you can avoid conventional treatment. And how much of tests that are available out there, Doc, uh, when it comes to, let's say, when you have classification of breast tissue, which may be the early, early start of cancer, um, how are the tests so accurate to be able to say, oh, we better be careful with this. This is when we need to start treatment, whatever treatment you just mentioned. Um, are there more accurate testing when it comes to brain tumors or pancreas cancer or ovary cancers that they can do like a test, a blood test or um, any other kind of like uh, treatment that may show an indicator that something is going on? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And that's a really challenging area. And we actually address this in, in, uh, in our book, specifically around PSA and breast cancer, where the, the goal and for, for many cancers is to try and come up with a blood test where you can detect cancer before you can find it on a scan. And what are you going to do with that information is kind of what we argue. So let's say we detect uh, in me early prostate cancer from a blood draw in my arm and that they're circulating what are called uh, uh, CTCs, circulating tumor cells. Okay. What, what am I going to do with that? I'm not going to go get whole body radiation. Uh, you're not going to take out my prostate because if you look at my prostate, it's still healthy. Uh, but you know that I'm now prone to potentially getting prostate cancer. Um, so what chemo, you uh, uh, chem chemo prevention is taking this on and saying, well, let's develop a pill that will decrease the chance that these circulating tumor cells will turn into cancer but do not have the collateral damage uh, on our health. That has not been successful. Chemo prevention, nobody's going to take a pill that has a potential side effect to stop something from happening that you don't even know if it's going to happen. Uh, so the argument there is if, if I determine from a, a early detection, which they're working on, blood, that I have a risk of developing prostate cancer, then I got to double down, triple down, six tuple down on the mix of six. Uh, you know, I'm sorry to share this with all the listeners. Essentially, one in two of you have a risk of cancer. And if you're a guy, your risk of prostate cancer by the time you're 80 is like 80%. So do it now, you know, start, you know, living in this way 
now so that you can prevent cancer. And as Allison mentioned at the beginning, the majority of cancers are preventable at a minimum. And this is at a, at a minimum, 50% of cancers are preventable. And for some of the most common cancers, the percentage uh, that, that you can reduce the risk is even higher. And that's a, that's a reason why if you have children that, uh, and it's how we got into changing our lifestyle was that we started having children and Lorenzo was coming home from work talking about the research he was doing and the research at MD Anderson as well as around the world. And we, we realized that we could actually do something to help our kids. And so we started with our children changing their diet, making sure that they were healthy and doing exercise and all the rest of it. And then we realized that we weren't doing it. And so uh, then... <laughs> Exactly. So, so then we started making change and, you know, it's a process and it's uh, taken years, but it, it feels great. And we're giving tools to our kids and we continually recommit to living in this way, which feels great. And that's, you know, something that's extremely consistent about all of this research in the area of lifestyle. We're always looking at the Holy Grail. Will you live longer? Can you prevent cancer? Can you avoid um, conventional cancer treatments? What we can guarantee people is that they will feel better than they've ever felt in their lives, that they will be leading a more engaged and purposeful life. And, you know, if, if a, a lot of people uh, view, as, as you described about your mother, uh, cancer as, as a turning point, cancer as some people say the wake up call and, and a, a way to be able to uh, transform your life for the better. Why not do that today before you're diagnosed with cancer? Um, and that's really what, what we're hopeful that the readers of Anti-Cancer Living will be able to improve their lives. And hopefully there's the side effect of preventing cancer or pushing it way into the future. You know, I'm afraid that this podcast is going to make all of our listeners become hypochondriacs because, you know, with all they're going to start wondering, oh, should I go get tested? Or should I go get blood tests? Should I go get scanned? Should I go... So that in itself is either we bring fear because it's an imminent fear of people saying, well, if I don't, if I'm not proactive, I'm going to have to be reactive and reactive is not the best solution. So proactivity will allow people to be able to at least get treated before it gets worse. So for example, laser treatment, if let's say you were uh, diagnosed in the beginning stage of melanoma, can laser treatment be able to remove completely the, the, the cancer of the skin versus waiting until stage three, where you're going to have to take chemotherapy and all the other uh, uh, treatments. So that's the reason why when you start seeing like a little dot in the skin, should you panic? That's right. No, you shouldn't panic. No, you shouldn't panic. I mean, that's, you know, if we can detect cancer early and, and do what's necessary, and hopefully that can be just lifestyle when it's really early uh, or minor interventions, that's the best. I mean, it, again, back to what cancer is, it starts with one cell. Well, if you could get that cell out of there in this future world that, that it'll be interesting to see if, if we're around for it, but I see this as kind of the end goal. You would have, uh, well, ideally, we all leading healthy lives. And, and, but as Allison mentioned, even in the individuals who follow everything, there's just randomness, right? And, and when cells replicate, random stuff happens. And, and it's, it really is chance. So some is just pure chance. If you have a, you know, I, I hate to even, think in this way, because uh, I know people are starting to do this, this little nanobot that is in our body, it's microscopic and it's just floating around and like our immune system, but uh, because it's, it's programmed from the outside, uh, it won't have any theoretically flaws. Um, it can scan and kill that first mutated cell the minute it develops. Um, and therefore cancer would be gone that, you know, that, that is very science fiction in future, but oh, nanobot, sure. nanobots do exist already. So, uh, you, you never know what the future has in store, but what we have today is, uh, our lifestyle choices that we make every day. Um, and again, we need to make them not out of fear and trying to avoid something, but ultimately because you will feel good and lead a wonderful life. 
and there's a contagion about it. You know, this first small step you make that that feels good, that's in a new direction, in the in the direction that you want to go, that you feel purposeful about, that allows you to take the next step, and then you create positive contagion around everything that you're doing instead of that negative contagion. Hmm, wow. Now, would you say, uh, and that's we're going to be uh, finishing on that note. Um, if we look at the past, and we're talking about several hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, when we had people that were very tall, if you look at Goliath and all the other, they found even remains of people that were eight feet tall. And now it seems like the average height is around five, seven, five, eight. And the, the life expectancy has been shorter. But then at the same time, in this uh, century, because of medical advances, we have increased uh, uh, lifespan. So is it kind of like an electrocardiogram of, of how our life intends to be in the future, which maybe we may live until 120, but in a 200 years from now, we may go into 200 years old, or then, I mean, it's like an up and down. Why before they were living longer and now shorter, and then now the height was uh, taller before, now it's uh, shorter. How is that? Because it seems like before they, they were living a healthier lifestyle than what we have now because of the crappy food that is being sold in the supermarkets. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to your comment, you know, by and large, we're living longer now than, than we have in the past. Um, however, we have this added layer of, you know, what we're doing to the planet and indirectly to ourselves, uh, not the least of which is, is all of the uh, chemicals and the quality of the air and the water, et cetera. Um, you know, our, our ancestors primarily died of uh, not ancient ancestors, but, but the ones, you know, pre-industrial revolution um, of, of infectious diseases. Uh, now, certainly in, the, in high income countries, infectious disease is not the common cause of death. It's these chronic diseases of heart disease, diabetes, uh, cancer. Cancer and, and heart disease representing 50% of, uh, of deaths in, in developed countries. So I, I, I don't know. Uh, and, and, you know, medicine is essentially probably counteracting a lot of the negative things that we have created since the Industrial Revolution. And that's sort of this pivot point uh, when we started canning food. And then, of course, in the 60s, when we started, you know, adding all the chemicals to the food and chemicals to the fields and changing the air quality as, as energy consumption starts to go up. Um, you know, we we have to, you know, we know that we live in uh, a post-industrial world and, and we can't, you know, be too Pollyanna and think that we can go back and live the way hunter-gatherers did. Uh, but to the degree that we can live in a less processed way, you know, to use that term, in anything that we do, uh, I think is going to be healthy for us and ultimately healthier for the planet. Allison, any last words? Uh, I think that uh, Lorenzo said that very uh, beautifully, really. Uh, and that, you know, our, our place on the planet, you can look at the micro and the macro. So you can look at it from the, the, the big picture, which, which you have just both been speaking about and down to the small and that, you know, hopefully the two actually meet somewhere in the middle and that uh, for your listeners that, you know, the best place to start is right where you are right at this very moment in your own life and in your family's life or those you care about and that there's lots of very positive actions that we can take also on a national level as, as becoming an activist to help in, the, in these areas where pollution is, is uh, really um, dictating how our world is going. Uh, so I uh, encourage everybody and, and know that everybody can do some small steps to help themselves live the life that they wanna live. Beautiful, beautiful. Well. 
that's all the time that we have for today's podcast. I really do appreciate you, Dr. Cohen and uh, Allison Jeffrey, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to join us. Thank you for participating and inspiring our many listeners with your incredible story. Now, we hope you have all enjoyed today's episode. I'm very excited about the many upcoming guests that we have scheduled for the Happiness Journey podcast, filled with inspirational stories, just like the one that you listened to today. Now, here are a few concluding words of wisdom. The greatest wisdom is in simplicity. Love, respect, tolerance, sharing, gratitude, and forgiveness. It's not complex or elaborate. The real knowledge is free. It's encoded in your DNA. All you need is within you. Great teachers have said that from the beginning. Find it in your heart and you'll find your way. My name is Dr. Dan Amzalag, and you may all keep pursuing your amazing journey in life.